Hello, I'm Don Bales with MSU Extension Service, Department of Forestry. The topic of our next presentation in managing the family forest is managing for multiple use. We want to talk about some basic ecological concepts, but mainly we want to try to uh, create an understanding and awareness of some those basic ecological principles and concepts and how they can be integrated into your wildlife management plan, your recreation plan, or any other consideration that you have outside the timber production issues that you're so familiar with. In a lot of places, white-tailed deer management kind of rules the day. That's why a lot of people own property. That's why a lot of people out there uh, uh, manage the way they do. They're primarily interested in white-tailed deer. As someone who specializes in forestry and wildlife management, uh, probably 95% of the calls that I get relate to how can I make my property a better wildlife habitat and in particular a better deer habitat. A lot of people concentrate more perhaps on timber production and that's okay too because they work very, very well with each other. Aesthetics. A lot of people really want to take into account what their forest looks like. There's some very neat things that you can do to improve what your forest looks like, whether it's to protect flowering plants like flowering dogwood or others out there to just improve the way your property looks. For most people, timber harvest is a must. If we do not harvest timber, we have to be, uh, we have to have an income stream outside that property to maintain it because we have taxes to pay and we have other costs of owning land. So timber harvest is a must from many angles. Economically, it's an angle. It's also uh, important that we harvest timber because we actually need to produce that income stream and we also need to uh, produce interruptions in the forest that enhance wildlife habitat and we'll go into that in detail in just a moment. Uh, we would like for you to plan for some open areas in the forest. Open areas are particularly valuable for many species. Uh, wild turkeys, for instance, we know that they use open areas in a greater proportion to their availability. Uh, and by that we mean if 10% of your property is in openings, turkeys are going to spend more than 10% of their time in that opening because it's a key habitat for them, for bugging areas, for the poults especially. A lot of people really want to protect and concentrate on recreation and their family uh, time that they spend on their property and that's why so many of them want to enhance their white-tailed deer and other huntable wildlife species populations. Uh, I want to introduce you to uh, a guy named Aldo Leopold who said the land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soil, waters, plants, and animals or collectively the land. He was known by many as the father of modern wildlife conservation. And he's written a number of essays, and, and, and these essays go back almost 100 years. And he was the first one to, to develop that land ethic, and we really have to take care of our land. We, we want to start with the soil, because the soil is everything. That's where everything comes from. When we teach children, uh, we teach them that everything that we have, everything that we grow, everything that provides shelter for us, uh, goes back to the soil. It goes back to good soil and clean water. Uh, just pick out whatever part of the state that you live in. Uh, you will see that uh, soil types and major soil types are uh, dispersed across the state with the lowest part down in the southern part of the state there. That is our poorest soil type. It's unique. It's different. But as far as the soil productivity level with the levels of nutrients and a neutral pH, it's kind of on the bottom of the scale. When we move up into the delta, that's our richest soil type, of course, due to, to the alluvial deposits. Uh, across the rest of the state, uh, we have soil types that are intermediate to that. So getting to know exactly where your property is located, which one of these major physiographic soil regions your property is located in will help you. Uh, site index for timber growth is based on the soil type, the aspect, and the drainage. This is the major thing that I, that I try to get across to people is how plant succession works. That's an ecological concept that basically states when there's open ground created, whether it's from a catastrophic event such as a tornado or a, a wildfire or a hurricane or just uh, we abandon a field. When we go back to bare ground, plant succession starts with annual plants that come from seed. 
Uh, sometimes there's rootstock left out there, depending on the previous forest use and how the site became open ground again. Then it moves into perennial plants and grasses and gradually moves into shrubs and vines and into uh, softwood trees like pines or sweet gums. And these first trees to inhabit this site will be light seeded species that are blown in by the wind, unless of course you have rootstock that's left out there. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. All right. As a land manager, when this open ground becomes available, whether it be from a harvest cut such as this, a total regeneration harvest was planned for this property, um, you can stop right there. You can just allow whatever happens to happen out there, and there will once again be a forest there one day, 30 or 40 years down the line. But how you manage that and how you uh, manipulate that plant succession will help you realize more profit, help you maximize wildlife habitat as well. Uh, this is a example of what some would call the climax forest. In other words, uh, it is oak, beech, magnolia, and that picture has all three of those species in there. I don't know if you can see them all, but this is the stage, uh, ecologists tell us, is the final stage, or the stage at which the forest will kind of maintain that oak, beech, uh, hickory climax. So what we want to do is, is think about that and how that progresses. If you want, you know, a lot of big open hardwood land, you want to try to manage for that, and you can do that. All right, are you going to let it take its course, or will you manage it? All right, now, if you do a, a harvest cut, or if you abandon a hay field, or a row crop field, you're going to get different plant succession models that take that over. For instance, in this uh, hay field right here, there's no remnant rootstock. Everything that comes back out there will be from seed that come in or perhaps some briars and other things that, that may still be out there in that pasture, depending on how well they maintain the pasture. Uh, this is an example of some, some pine land, pine hardwood that was cut over, regenerated to pine tree. That plant succession model operates quite differently because you'll have a lot of woody species trying to take over that site. And from a forest management standpoint, you probably need to control some of those hardwood species if it's not high quality hardwood site. All right, this is another picture that you see where a pine plantation was established during the conservation uh, reserve program days back in the mid 80s. And this was one of those bahia grass and mixed grass hay fields that was planted to pine. It's a winter photograph, so what you see is a little bit deceiving. There's quite a bit of uh, woody stuff out there, but that's because we're well into the 15th to 17th year of the stand right here, I think, or 12th year, I believe it is. We're in about 12th year of this stand, they're getting ready to thin the stand. So everything that happens in that plant succession model depends on how the land became open or what the rate of uh, reversion to the old habitat is. Now as far as a wildlife habitat standpoint, a lot of people will say, I do not want pine plantations on my land, there's not enough food for wildlife. Are they correct? Well you have to uh, uh, further define the question, do you mean during the whole life of the entire pine stand, there's not enough food for wildlife. And which species of wildlife are you referring to? There's always going to be some food for some wildlife in any part of a pine stand. Or are you referring to just certain periods of the stand? Now, this stand right here is at that point in time when it's just, it's at, it's at its worst for providing forage and mass production. But things can be changed as we'll see later. The first three years, you got basically a grass community with a few pine trees planted in it. At age four to seven, the pines begin to greatly, uh, more greatly dominate the site. The limbs are beginning to try to close and they're also being invaded with briars and trees and, and even some broadleaf weeds are beginning to creep in there. Then at age eight through the time that you do your first thinning, at, depending on the site, 12 to 15 years old, you know, pine trees and straw with some scattered trees and some oaks and some others beginning to invade are going to dominate that site. So at that point in time, in reference to white-tailed deer, that's the lowest forage uh, producing period of the stand. All right, forest management manipulates plant succession. Uh, that's your avenue to change how things happen. If you let that pine stand gradually thin itself out, there will never be any really good openings created in there. But if we go in with a thinning job like you saw right there, you can produce food for uh, white-tailed deer like this. Now I want to take you through a series of pictures to show you because all these photographs of these deer were taken in a 
primarily pine plantation environment with some hardwood streamers and some openings and some wildlife food plots. If you go through there and look, I don't think you could say there's not enough food for wildlife because it's evident that there are some really good animals being produced in there. Now, if you look at that, one thing I want you to focus on is the, the amount of diversity you see. You, you, if your eyes follow across the screen, you will see that there's no continuous block that looks exactly the same. It goes from uh, different pine stands, hardwood streamers, and so forth. All right? When we zoom in a little better, a little closer, we start seeing some little food plots, wildlife food plots showing up. There's some open hay fields in there. There's an abandoned uh, grassy strip that used to be an airstrip on this particular property. There's little ponds where the margins are grown up. So there's a variety of uh, diversity out there. Now, and again, from a, from a hunting standpoint for white-tailed deer, this property being a pine plantation country all the way around it, pine plantation everywhere, produced some really nice animals for harvest for hunters, as, as you can see. Now, in order for any uh, forest to, to, to grow a quality wildlife population, and again, we're going to concentrate on white-tailed deer. We're looking at the quantity and quality of the food, how much water is available, very seldom a limiting factor in the southeastern United States. Cover, usually not a problem in the southeastern United States. It generally boils back to how much uh, food's there, and again, the quantity is generally not an issue. It's primarily the quality of the food and we're going to discuss how you can do a better job of producing that. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about diversity later, but horizontal diversity means, you know, from uh, one side of your property to the other, how much diversity is there? If your stand is all uh, eight-year-old plantation pine, you'll want to, as soon as you can, start providing some thinnings and that sort of thing. You want to, uh, if you look at that photograph in the lower right of the slide, you'll see some uh, streamside management zones and other presenters will talk to you about how to uh, maintain water quality. But from here, if we're looking at this from a wildlife population perspective, we've got travel corridors, we've got diversity, there's edges, and again, we'll talk more about those edges in just a minute, but there's going to be a high wildlife diversity in anything where you have lots of edge and lots of different plant communities. The vertical structure would mean uh, from top to bottom. You know, you've got a shrub layer, a uh, herb layer on the ground, you've got an understory and a midstory. As a, an example of a midstory plant might be, uh, you know, a suppressed tree of some kind of maple. Uh, an understory plant might be a uh, flowering dogwood. And then the shrub layer down there would be anything from uh, herbaceous weeds and vines like smilax or honeysuckle or any of, any of the others. Now. A lot of people want to concentrate on, on, on mass when they're thinking about availability of food for their white-tailed deer herd. Uh, smart wildlife managers know that mass is great. It helps. It produces high-energy food. It helps deer get through the winter. It makes them more, uh, you know, reproductively sound. Forage, however, is that stuff that's available year-round. If you don't have forage around year-round, uh, you're not going to have nearly as many deer. Uh, and we'll talk about native plants too because as you know uh, we've only been planting wildlife food plots and, and, and buying high powered seed mixes from any number of companies out there and all those are good but our wildlife existed on, on native plants and, and we had great wildlife populations before we ever started planting wildlife food plots so don't forget those uh, we all want some type of silver bullet we all want some type of thing that can help us manage better but as wildlife biologists, we always emphasize starting with habitat management first, and then you augment or supplement your native forage management where needed with some wildlife food plot nutrition. All right, now, uh, wildlife biologists generally would agree with, with this dog. Uh, feeding is not wildlife management. A lot of people, when they acquire property or want to start managing for wildlife, the first thing they want to do is start going out and throwing feed on the ground. We don't have time to talk about that in great detail, but again, that's, that's a last resort thing. It's not a good thing to do, and here's why. We used to call it the four Ps when I was a student here at Mississippi State. It's pathogens, which whenever animals are concentrated, they're more likely to transmit diseases to each other with nose touching and other types of transmission. 
Parasites, the same thing. Some of the deer leave parasites uh, in and around a feed site that other deer pick up when feeding off the ground. And then, of course, predators. One thing people don't really think about that much is if a poacher decides he wants to come on your property to hunt, the easiest place for him to, to take a deer would be a feeding site where perhaps you're feeding deer just for the enjoyment of watching them or feeding wild turkeys. But whenever you feed, you subject your wildlife populations to these four, uh, four Ps. All right, now let's get back to forage and, and what makes good forage. Uh, I had a, a client one time that wanted me to look at some things and I was trying to emphasize to him the need to get away from concentrating on wildlife food plots and concentrating more on native plant management and then supplementing with the food plots. Uh, I've got some blanks up there and I want you to try to guess. In Amet County in the summer of 2001, we went out and just started looking around and some, there was some common ragweed out there. Common ragweed was being heavily utilized by deer and we decided that we would test it to see what the protein content was because they were eating it heavily uh, where it was coming up in a clover patch and they were also eating it out in the pine stand that had been thinned and where the soil had been disturbed and these native seeds that were lying dormant in that seed bank germinated. All right. Uh, when, when I asked the landowner and he went around and he picked some, out, some ragweed out of the food plot, I picked some out of the forest and then we sent them to the lab. I got the results and I asked him, what do you think the crude protein content is? And he knew that 16% crude protein was ideal for wildlife forage for, for white-tailed deer. The optimum development somewhere around 16%. Everybody agrees on that. And I said, well, how much do you think this ragweed had in crude protein content level in the out in the forest. He said, oh, maybe about 6%. I said, a little higher. He said, well, how about 8 or 10? I said, well, what do you think it was in the area where you limed and fertilized and you planted clover? He said, oh, maybe 10 or 12. All right, I'm going to tell you what it actually was, and you'll see the value of good forage management and natural plant management. All right, in the forest out there, just in a general forest area, it was 24% crude protein and 74% total digestible nutrition. All right, contained 27% uh, in the clover plot where it was limed and fertilized. So we saw two things here. We saw a high nutrient content in native forage, and we also saw that limer and lime and fertilizer had enhanced that uh, nutrient content of those plants. All right, another good forage, and I don't recommend planting this stuff, Chinese privet hedge. It's everywhere in the state of Mississippi. In the inset photo, you'll see what a normal privet hedge frond or tip end would look like if deer weren't browsing it. You'll see that uh, opposite leaf design and you'll see that it's just kind of, it'll produce a big long uh, lanky stem that'll hang down. But wherever deer can get to it, uh, you'll see that broomed back or that hedged effect. Uh, it, it's highly attractive to deer because it has a high protein content. And here's some of the stuff that I did in January in Wilkinson County. Uh, a number of years ago, we went out, and again, this is the, the worst part of uh, what you would think evergreen forage, the protein content would be for that time of year. We're looking at protein contents, every one of them at or above 16%, and that total digestible nutrition, if you're not familiar with that, anything over 60, 65% is, is excellent. So you can see that na native forage is even in the dead of winter uh, in most parts of Mississippi. Now that varies by soil type. So uh, if you want to do some neat things, you can collect some of this stuff, take it to the county extension office, and they can send it to the forage lab for you and analyze whether it's your food plot forage or whether it's your native forage. We can do that for you. All right, remember, the less forage you have, the less deer you're going to have. And all these plant communities that, that are high in forage, if there's a lot of forage, there's more rabbits, there's a lot of other things out there. So forage and green stuff at ground level supports a lot of wildlife populations. So when we get into these pine stands and begin to thin, we know that more forage is going to mean more deer. And what we're doing, you know, back to that plant succession diagram and that model, we're trying to intervene, we're trying to get sunlight on the ground, and research shows that most plants have a higher content, protein content when they're grown out in the sun rather than when they're grown in the shade. All right, deer forage in pine basal area uh, it, it, basically that's just a measure of how many trees are out there, how much uh, shading effect these trees are having. Uh, if you look at the graph from on the bottom basal area is from left to right. The higher basal area goes up to 120 and the blue bars represent the number of pounds of forage. 
And as that forage level uh, begins to decline, you can see why. It's because the pine trees are getting bigger and thicker and the crowns are closing. So you see that rapid decline of forage when you get up to 60 and then 90 and then 120 square feet of basal area. Quite often when we do these presentations, people ask, what in the world is basal area? And what does that mean? Again, it's just a measure of the density of the trees out there and how much of the site they're occupying. Foresters use this in a relative way to try to describe to each other you know, what's out there on the ground. All right, if you went out and cut a tree down at four and a half feet and measured the cross-sectional area of that, that would be an amount in square feet. A 13 and a half inch tree is about one square feet of basal area. So if you have 100 uh, trees like that on an acre, you got 100 square feet of basal area per acre. All right, so a common stand of pine plantation at 15 years old, again, depending on site fertility, would have a basal area somewhere between 110 and 140 square feet of basal area. And a common practice would be to thin that back to say 70 to 80 square feet of basal area. Again, if you thin it back to 60, that would be more optimal for wildlife, but it may not be the best for, for timber production. So there's some of those things that we need to consider. All right, from a timber management standpoint, it's your best tool. Anytime you want to uh, have an effect on your wildlife or regulate that effect, uh, we recommend you look into how you're harvesting and regenerating your site preparation, uh, intermediate stand treatments, you know, herbicides that you might use, injecting undesirable hardwoods. All those things can help you get more sunlight and more forage out there. Uh, and before you do any civil cultural practice, we recommend that any special habitat components be inventoried and protected. There may be an old home place. There may be any number of things that you want protected. Uh, your favorite hunting spot in a particular draw or, or, or hardwood bottom. There's, there's a lot of things you can do when you're the landowner, when you're the manager. All right, and, and, and let's talk about fire as a management tool quickly because when we mentioned it the first that we don't want to throw away any cogs and that wheel of what's going on out there. All the parts we want still out there. Fire is an integral part of the Piney Woods Forest in the southeastern United States, whether they're caused, started by a man or whether they're caused by lightning fires. But our plants and our animals are adapted to that fire regime. This is an example of a thinned and burned stand. And as you can see, there's basically no mid-store. Well, you might say that's good. Well, if you're somebody who loves uh, songbirds, that may not look like you want it to look. So that's why we talk about diversity. When we incorporate wildlife management into our forest management plans, it's harder to do on a 40 acre piece of ground. But if you own 200 or more acres, everything you do out there, you could consider perhaps a key species concept. You can't manage every acre for every species of wildlife. So the Forest Service back in the 70s originated a concept they call the key species concept, where in some tracks they would manage primarily for deer, Others, they would pay more attention for non-game species and endangered species. But when we manage for diversity, what we want to do is produce different age classes of stands with different amounts of mid-level vegetation, uh, horizontal diversity as well as vertical diversity, and again, plan for the openings. Uh, when we manage those openings, and I'm going to skip through this slide because we're going to talk to it, that issue a little bit more. You know, how can I justify leaving openings? If you're a you know, dyed in the wool uh, guy who's in it primarily for profit, you might say, well, I'm not gonna leave any openings out there because I'm gonna be giving up valuable timber growth. Well, let's make some assumptions. Let's say you own a thousand acres and you don't hunt yourself and you see no value in openings and you want it all to grow timber. But the people you lease your hunting rights to see value in it. How do you compromise on that? Well, if you own a thousand acres, and let's just make a, an assumption that it's your timber annualized growth rate is going to produce $70 per acre per year of income over a, a long rotation. And then let's just say that your hunters would like for you to leave 1% open. What's that going to cost you? Well, if, if you look at the growth loss to the openings, it's $700 in a year's time. But if you prorate that $700 across the entire thousand acres, you come up with uh, 70 cents an acre. That's all you have to charge an extra fee on the lease to allow the opening to exist for wildlife and also to uh, recover your cost from allowing that uh, timberland to go into an opening. All right, and then managing those openings. There's lots of ways to do that. Food plots, wheat and rye, brassicas, you got red and white clovers you can plant that's more perennial. 
Uh, again, native plant management, we really emphasize that and we'd like to see you do a lot of that. You can na manage native plants with any number of things from fire. Uh, if you got a wetland, you can manipulate the water levels. You can fertilize, you can strip disc. Uh, some of these plants you can cut back and allow them to come back. And this feathered edge is, is, is producing a lot of natural forage out there in addition to the, the plants that they uh, plant on an annual basis. Now again, white-tailed deer, if that's what you're interested in, uh, the deer stand in this particular stage, in that stage three and four area for a reason. It, what it depicts is that's where he's going to spend most of his time to eat. He's going to spend time out there as, as cover. He's going to go into stage six, into the mature forest for mass when he wants uh, uh, oak or, or beech mast or anything like that that they eat in the forest, in the bigger forest. Uh, but he spends a lot of his time and a lot of his forage requirements are met in that stage four, that plant succession. And anytime you've got more of that, uh, that stage of plant succession on your property, you will produce more deer. And then of course quail and other birds like stage one. Uh, in your Managing the Family Forest book, uh, I've listed all sorts of uh, uh, requirements and, and, and management tips to, to manage for other wildlife populations besides just the deer that we're concentrating on here today. So be sure and look into that and uh, look through that book when you get a chance. All right. When it comes to openings, a, a lease with openings on it is more valuable. As somebody who used to deal with lots and lots of hunters, uh, and lots and lots of deer clubs, uh, it was important to them to have openings for places to hunt. They like to visit their camp. They like to plant food plots. So make those openings available for wildlife and also make them available for hunters. And they'll pay you to plant them sometime. Uh, in summary, we want to manage for diversity. If you want a lot of different types of wildlife out there, you want to create a lot of different wildlife populations. You want to conduct frequent forest management activities that alter and set back plant succession. Remember, sunlight equals forage and it also improves the quality of that forage. You want to do timber sales, control burning, strip disking. Again, anything that disturbs the soil and anything that disturbs uh, the, the plant layers and, and it'll stimulate growth. Th those are the things you want to do. Frequent invasions in that forest that manipulate and keep different stages of that plant succession all present on your property at one time will increase your wildlife populations. Remember, uh, you know, a lot of people have the idea that if they just do nothing, if they never cut, their forest is going to stay the same. And, and it's not. It's going to march through that plant succession diagram over time. Even a pine stand over three or four hundred years will gradually turn to primarily a hardwood stand because pine trees are relatively short-lived and they begin to die from insect attack and every other manner of mortality uh, that's out there. So again, habitat diversity is the key to wildlife diversity and good forest management pays. It pays financial dividends and good forest management will produce high quality wildlife habitat for you as well. Uh, again, thank you for tuning in to Managing the Family Forest and we hope you'll view other sections of our presentations as well. Thank you.